this last lecture is on a topic of pregnancy, meeting the challenges. And what I'm going to try to do is, you know, focus on the uh, perhaps the less common aspect of ectopic pregnancy, the less common location. So I hope you find it interesting. So we all know that it has increased, the incidence of ectopic pregnancy has increased significantly over the past several years, probably for two reasons. First of all, there is a dramatic improvement in detection of ectopic pregnancies thanks to endovaginal ultrasound and combination of endovaginal ultrasound and quantitative serum beta ECG. And also, there are increased incidence of contributing risk factors such as pelvic inflammatory disease, treatment for infertility, smoking, etc. But the good news is that with endovaginal ultrasound, we have been able to achieve early diagnosis, which decreases not only mortality but also morbidity, as well as allow less invasive treatment with better preservation of future fertility. We'll go one by one through these challenges. So first of all, just in any woman of reproductive age, think about the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy, no matter what her presentation is. Because a classic triad of abdominal pain, vaginal bleeding, and palpable adnexal mass is actually not that common. So this is a good example. This is a patient who came in here. The so she said, oh, the patient checked for IUP, the patient's pregnant. And she has white epicardium pain, check for acute cholecystitis. Her gallbladder was normal, but she had some fluid, I should say. It's not ascites, actually. In a young woman, always think about the possibility for an ectopic pregnancy. So, so we looked in the pelvis, and of course, she did not have an IUP, but she had an ectopic pregnancy with blood in the pelvis as well as blood in the moistened pouch, and that was... What brought her to the emergency room was her white epicardium pain. So always think about the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy in a young woman. And even if a pelvic ultrasound is not ordered, just you know, look for it. Now, is transabdominal ultrasound still necessary? You know, again, we want to do things as, as quickly as possible. And oftentimes, it's, uh, at least in, in the U.S., they just order transvaginal ultrasound. I really think in patients with ectopic pregnancy, it is absolutely necessary to do a transabdominal ultrasound. First of all, it allows you to very do a very quick survey of the abdomen. So this patient who had here no IUP, large amount of clot, and probably the ectopic right here in the pelvis, we could quickly move the transducer up to the upper abdomen, she the extent of peritoneum, and basically send her to, to the OR. This other thing is, I think that transabdominal ultrasound is really, really helpful in clarifying ectopic pregnancies in unusual locations. Now, the other thing uh, that's important is to distinguish early IUP from its mimic because now one of the treatment for early ectopic pregnancy is intramuscular methotrexate or for medical abortion of failed IUP is so mesoprostol. So, we do not want to give methotrexate to somebody who could have an early IUP, right? So, and, and now we don't really, many of these early topics will go to treatment without laparoscopy. So it's really important, in my opinion, to make sure that you know that there is no viable IUP. And actually, there have been lawsuits that in the U.S. for patients only being given methotrexate when we weren't sure whether there were, it wasn't made clear that there could be a viable IUP, you know, if the, if the report is vague. So it's really, really important. Okay. It's a responsibility of our, our responsibility to make sure that we don't terminate a potentially normal IUP. And because most women are hemodynamically stable, we really, if you're not sure, we have opportunity to do follow up either with serial beta ACG or follow up ultrasound. So when I have a question on the topic pregnancy, the first thing I do is look at the uterus because it's easy to diagnose an intrauterine pregnancy, right? So 90% of patients who are referred for rule out ectopic actually have an IUP. And heterotopic pregnancy or the presence of an IUP with an ectopic pregnancy is actually uncommon. So if you have a pregnant patient and you've located the, uter the pregnancy in the uterus, you pretty much can breathe a lot easier unless there are exceptional circumstances such as in, uh, patients who are treated for infertility. So let's look at the first challenge 
is known to recognize very, very early IUP and differentiate it from its mimic. So here, this is an example of very early intrauterine pregnancy. This is an intradecidual sac and very small gestational sac. But the reason I think it's a gestational sac, it's, it's, it's just underneath the endometrium and it has this subtle echogenic border, right? So this, I would say that I said it is, if I would put it this case, I would say it's very likely that it's a very early intrauterine pregnancy. However, of course, I don't see a yolk sac. I don't see fetal pose. I cannot comment on the viability of the pregnancy, but I think it's more likely that this patient will have an early IUP and just follow the beta HCG. Well, in this case, this is very different. Right? There is fluid in the endometrium. The endometrium is slit. This is inside the endometrium. So this is not a gestational sac. This is a pseudo-gestational sac in a patient that had an ectopic pregnancy. So just learn how to recognize the very, very early sign of a very small intrauterine gestational sac or early intrauterine pregnancy. So that this patient, you can be very clear that I think this could be an IUP and don't give this patient methotrexate. Okay. So with ectopic pregnancy, what are the endometrial findings? Because the endometrial will go undergo the decidual reaction from the hormone changes of the pregnancy, right? So you may have a normal endometrium, or you can have a thick endometrium, just as you see in this case, and this patient had a small ectopic pregnancy right there. Or you can have this decidual cyst, which are these eccentric cysts. Now, why is this a decidual cyst and not a gestational sac? It can be a little tricky, but this one doesn't have as well-defined echogenic border. I have to admit this is a little tough, right? But we always look very carefully at the index sign. This patient had an index on mass, and so she did have an ectopic pregnancy. In this old paper, Alliance from Winnipeg had thought that they had the 80% predictive, positive predictive value for early ectopic pregnancy if you saw this decidual cyst. I have to admit, it's very, very uncommon to see that. So I'm not sure I buy what they said, but I just want to put it out there because it was published. Okay? So if you have cystic structure in the uterus, it could be just fluid, or it could be early gestational sacs. This one... We don't see anything in there. This one, we see a little yolk sac. However, you have to be careful because what about this case? So this one kind of looks like a gestational sac, but it has internal echoes. And again, we always look very carefully at the next. Uh, this patient happened to have also an ectopic pregnancy. And what we thought was that this was a pseudo-gestational sac. What happens is sometimes there is hemorrhage within the decidual reaction of the endometrium. And it can look like a pseudo-gestational sac. This patient was treated with methotrexate, failed, and underwent a sap injectin. Okay. So the other thing is we need to, if we see an adnexal mass, we want to see is that in the ovary, because if it's in the ovary, it's much more likely to be a corpus sudum, or is it separate from the ovary in the fallopian tube, and that is much more likely to be an ectopic pregnancy. The vast majority of ectopic pregnancy are the, in the ampullary portion of the fallopian tube. So the ultrasound findings are pretty simple. No IUP and an adnexal mass separate from the uterus. And this has a very high specificity and sensitivity in this really old study, but this still holds true today. So the direct sign of ectopic pregnancy, adnexal mass separate from the ovary. So sometimes if you're not sure whether a mass is in separate from the ovary or not, I mean, here it's pretty clear, this is a corpus serum and this is the ectopic pregnancy, you can kind of push on the uh, ovary, do a bimanual, push on the ovary or the mass with a vaginal probe and push on the, on the belly with the other hand and you'll see that these two moves kind of separately. And so you know that this is a at next or mass separate from the OV. In this case, you could see a yolk sac and fetal pole as well. So that's pretty clear that this is an ectopic pregnancy. Now, it's very uncommon to actually see a live fetus. That's the least common presentation.
a more common presentation is in a gestational sac. Again, why is it called an indexal ring? Because it has a cystic area with an echogenic border. Now, this one has a yolk sac. So it's clearly a small ectopic pregnancy. And this was treated with methotrexate with very good response. Or sometimes you will just see an indexal ring. In this case, the important thing here is that a patient was pregnant, has no IUP, and has a mass which is separate from the ovary. She was treated with left sapogostomy. This is another example, again, very amorphous mass. So again, you have to make sure that you can separate this from the adjacent ovary because most ectopic pregnancies are in the fallopian tube. And sometimes all you'll see, and I saw a case recently, all you'll see is just basically hematocelpines. You have a tubular structure filled with this amorphous material. But if you look very, very carefully, in the hematocelpine, sometimes you'll see the ectopic pregnancy. And this is a pregnancy that was bleeding inside the fallopian tube. Now, she had a very high CG. She was very symptomatic. So they did a sapangostomy and was able to take the ectopic out. She also had a hematocelpine and then repair the fallopian tube. Now, again, just to show you how you differentiate a mass is this mass in the ovary or is it adjacent to the ovary? The ovary has a big corpus sudum. This patient also was pregnant, had complex fluid in the cholesterol sac. So every time you have echogenic fluid in the cholesterol sac in a patient who is pregnant, you have to be concerned that it's an ectopic pregnancy, right? And again, you press, you do a bimanual with a vaginal probe on one hand, the hand on the top of the woman's belly on the other hand, and you'll see that this moves separately from the ovary.